Welcome back. Uh, here we're today. We're going to do the second part on our discussion of BC and natural logs, and pretty much going to take a look at uh, application problems, the word problems in the book. Um, there's a new formula that I'd like to introduce you to today. Um, it has to do with compound interest. Uh, let's do a little bit of review on what compound interest entail. Let's say you invest some money in an account. Let's, let's just pick a number out here. Let's call it $100. Just to make it simple. $100. And let's just say you invest that $100 at 10% uh, interest per year and let, let's just say 10% just to make this easy and easy to talk about that's a yearly rate interest rates are always a year and so one year from now your earnings would have been 10% of $100 or $10 and so your new balance in that account would be with the original 100 plus the interest or $110 now let's say that's you let that money then ride in your account for the next year. It starts out now at $110 because we've added that original amount uh, into the, the interest earned. And again, you go at 10% interest for another year. And this year, 10% of, of $110 is $11. You made more money this year, a little bit more money. Um, that's what happens when you're compounding is that the money earns go, grows faster because your your uh, knit your uh, your value that you're earning interest on continues to increase. So let's add that to what you had at the beginning of the year. Now you've got $121. All right, let's say you take that $121 and you put it in the bank again for another year at 10%, and this year you're going to earn $12 and 10 cents. Again, it's growing faster. The first year it grew a dollar, this year it's growing a uh, dollar ten. So now we have hundred and thirty two dollars and ten cents. As you can see, every year we earn interest, we it accrues a little quicker and quicker. Now you can see that that if we uh, increase the amount of times that we take this interest the amount will continue to grow and grow faster and faster in other words this thing called compounding it makes a small difference compounding makes a small difference how often we calculate how often we calculate that interest so if we calculate it yearly one time a year or two times a year, uh, that would be semi-annually, or four times a year, that would be quarterly, or uh, 12 times a year, of course, monthly, or we could even go 360 times a year, which would be daily. Usually we use the number 360, although some insist on using 365. So how often we compound it does make a little bit of difference. If we compound it a little more often, we're continuing to build that amount on a higher amount more often. We keep at, we adding that amount in more at more often. Now what would happen if we compounded this continuously an infinite number of times? Well, you would think oh man I would be gaining a lot a lot more money well that's that's true but it, it isn't true that it's that much more money it's going to be a little bit more because you're calculating or compounding it more often Le, uh, we have a formula for this and it uses E and you'd think that the, uh, the the difference is huge here there isn't that much difference between these and continuously but it is a slight difference in continuously compounding interest is usually the better choice if you have the choice. Let's take a look at that. All right. Here is a comparison of the two types of compounding. If you're asked to compound something monthly or daily or yearly, 
we change this N here, that's an N right there, you change the N so it, it corresponds to the, the compounding, compounding. Let's say, for example, we invest that $100 at 10% uh, interest and we compound it, or let's say quarterly, we would put a four here too, and then we would be able to put our time, the time in there to see how much money we would have accrued at the end of a month or a year or 10 years or what it is. Notice that the interest rate is still here. The, the number of compoundings is here. This is periodic compounding. And by the way, this plus sign that's here is automatically adding the interest rate to the original amount. One, that one stands for 100%. So we're adding that on automatically to give us the current, the new, or the future amount in your account. Now, continuous compounding, the formula is actually quite simpler, but it uses the E in here, Euler's number, and it puts the rate up here, which is a bit odd. This combination of Euler's number and this interest rate being up in the exponent makes for an odd combination, but it actually allows us to calculate uh, compound interest on a continuous basis. Now, I like this formula and I call it the, the PERT formula. Just try to remember that R and T are both up. Let's try one of these problems. All right, here's our formula for continuous compounding of interest. And you notice we've got the interest rate up here. I put it up here at 5% interest. 5% interest over 10 years with an initial uh, investment, your investment, or the uh, principal, we call that, the principal is $1,000. The principal, spelled P-L-E is $1,000. So we put $1,000 into our account and we co compound this continuously for 10 years at 5% interest. Now this is just a matter of grabbing the calculator and punching it, punching in to see what we get. Let's take a look at that. Alright, all right. here's that number, those numbers that are punched in here. Had $1,000 invested in an account times E raised to the 0.05, that's 5% for 10 years and it tells us how much money we'll have at the end of 10 years at 5% compounded continuously. Turns out $1,648.72. Um, this shows us the continuous compounding. Now I'm going to jot that number down and let's try this problem again over the same period of time compounded quarterly and let's see the difference compounding continuously makes with say quarterly compounding. All right, there's that amount that we got from continuous compounding, $1,648.72. But let's do it, instead of compounding it infinitely number of times, an infinite number of times, let's just compound it every quarter. That's four times a year. For 10 years, still 5% interest. Let's see what that calculation comes up with. All right, I calculated that on my own there. And notice the difference here. It's not substantial, but it is a little bit. Um, notice compounded continuously and compounded quarterly. This was done quarterly, every four times a year, quarterly. And notice the difference is about $5. $5.10, not much. But what it says is that the more often you compound something, the faster your money will grow. You keep adding that, that initial amount to the, in, the interest continuously, you do it more often, and your interest will grow faster. So compounding continuously, if you had your choice, would, would, that's what you'd choose, because the money will compound faster. It's only about five bucks. And uh, just the contrast is, let's do this yearly and see how yearly would be. All right, there it is, if we compounded your money yearly, you'd get $1,628. Doing it four times a year, that's a, an additional 15 bucks or so. And doing it, compounding it uh, continuously, that's a difference of 
See, there is a slight difference the more often that you compound it. Now, that, that point is made here, but uh, it's just to help you understand that the more often you compound something, the, uh, the quicker your money will grow. All right, let's do another problem here. All right, here's problem 28 from your book. Um, one thing you're going to have to really focus in on when you do this is to really pay attention to how the compounding is done so you'll know which formula to use. Since it says we're going to compound this continuously, I know that I'm going to have to use the PERT formula. So the, the amount in my account is going to be the principal times RE raised to the RT. So, you know, where everything goes, the principal is the initial amount that goes in the account. That's $150. And uh, E is not a variable. It is, of course, that uh, Euler's number, which is that 2.718. How it works here is a little bit of a mystery to all of us, but uh, but the higher mathematicians. So uh, the interest rate is 4%. We're going to write that as a decimal, 0.04 times five years. So we'll go ahead and put that in our calculator and see see how it, how it looks. So there we've got it inserted in the calculator. $150 is the principal. E is in the problem. We've got an interest rate of 4%. For five years. Now don't forget that uh, that E is that we're using the E to the X key which is right down here. It's the second LN button. It's right here E to the X. Punch that button and you'll produce E with a with a, a box for you to put your in, your interest rate in there for you to put uh, something in the exponent. Let's see what we get. $183.21. $183.21. Easy to do. Let's look at the next one. All right, let's take a look at problem 18 in your book. You've got it there. I'm going to go ahead and read it. Just You can read along with me. It says the altimeter in an airplane gives the altitude, or H, in height, in feet, excuse me, of a plane above sea level by measuring the outside air pressure. Again, what's happening here is that you can tell your altitude by looking at the the air pressure as you go higher in the sky the air pressure gets less and less so you can determine your uh, your altitude by just looking at the air pressure so the air pressure and the height the altitude H stands for altitude here are related to one another now here's the formula that they give us find a formula for the height in terms of the outside air pressure what are they saying find a formula for the height in terms of the outside air pressure. Well, remember that terminology, finding a formula for H in terms of P, that means we're going to solve this equation and get H alone. We're finding the height in terms of air pressure. That's a, a phrase that's going to be used occasionally. He says, well, find the, find, the, you know, find the height in terms of the pressure. You're going to end up having to turn this around. So let's go ahead and solve this. In order to do that, we're going to have to use logarithms here. In fact, we're going to have to use natural logs because um, the variable is up in the exponent that we want to get alone. So we're going to just let P come along for the ride as we do this. All right. Well, what's been done to H? Well, it's been made negative and divided by 26,200. Then it was made an exponent. All of that was made an exponent of E. And then that was multiplied by 101.3. So what we're going to do is we're going to divide both sides by this 101.3, 101.3. So I'm going to rewrite it over here, 101.3. On the bottom, these are going out, and we're left with E to the negative H over 26,200. All right, now to get this variable down from its perch up there, we're going to have to take the natural log of both sides. I'm using the natural log because that has a base of E. So we'll take the natural log of both sides. You notice I'm writing natural log with a cursive L, and I'm also going to write the E in here because um, I want to remind you that this has got the base of E. The natural log base E of this thing here, and we'll take the natural log of the other side as well. Natural log base E of E. Excuse me of E raised to the negative H over 26.2.
Now, if you recall from yesterday's assignment, the natural log base E and E undo each other. And another way to say that is this guy just drives around to the front, you know, because it's powers of powers here. And natural log base E of E is one. So it's really gone. So let's bring it down. And we get negative H over 26,200 times this. Well, this is one. That undoes each other. I don't even need to re write the one. I could write it. I don't need to. Okay, they undid each other. All right, so now we have the variable down out of its perch, and we're just going to multiply both sides of this equation by 26,000. Let's make it a negative 26,200, and that allows us to get rid of both the, the, the 26,200 and the negative. We're going to multiply that on both sides. I don't have the room over here, but I'm going to multiply it over here anyway. So here, here we go. Uh, negative 26,200 times ln base e of this thing, p over 101.3 equals h. So now we've got h alone, and this is what the assignment asks us to do. That's a p there. Asked us to find an equation for the height in terms of the air pressure. So there it is. Okay, let's take a look at the next part of the problem. All right, problem 19 says, use the formula you found in exercise 18, this formula here, to approximate the height of a plane above sea level when the outside air pressure is 57 what they call kilopascals. Kilopascals is a way of measuring air pressure. So we're going to use this formula and just stick 57 in for the pressure, P. Let's go to the top of the page, next page. All right, I've rewritten our formula at the top there and I've also inserted the air pressure uh, that's measured at this airplane, 57 kilopascals. And so all we really need to do now is just grab the calculator because the variables alone over here, we just need to punch all of this in. This is quite a feat to, to punch all of this in. Let's go ahead and do that. All right, there you can see that I've, I've punched this in. Negative 26,000, yeah, 26,000 natural log. By the way, you notice they didn't write, put the E on the calculator of 57 divided by 101.3. Let's see what the solution is. They end up with this number. That looks like an altitude, and that's what it's supposed to be. 14,951, let's say. And that happens to be in feet. So the altitude is 14,951 feet. All right, I got looking back at my problem, I realized that I had copied the problem down wrong here. This should have been a 2. It should have been 200 right here. So I went ahead and put that in instead. It turns out our answer is just a little different. It turns out to be 15,066 feet. So it helps to copy the problem down correctly. Don't do that. I'm copying the problem down wrong. All right, let's take a look at another one. All right, let's take a look at just one more problem here. This is number 58. And this is a problem about population. And I noticed we mentioned to you before that population growth is also consider, always considered to, to be exponential growth. It, it grows at, a, at a, uh, a rate that's not linear. And why is that? Well, let's say, you know, two people will have two babies and now we've got four and four reproduce and they make eight and eight reproduce and they make 16 or whatever. So uh, whether it's people or you know, bacteria or rabbits or whatever, population growth in general is um, is an exponential function. Now here's a problem, number 58, that talks about the world's population. It says in the year 2000, the world's population was 6 billion. population continues to grow at a constant rate, the future population, P in billions, can be predicted by this formula here. You'll notice that there's the six, the initial amount is six billion, 
I know I wrote this as an ordered pair. The first year was year 2000, so that's the initial amount. We would we might call that year zero. Okay, year zero was six billion. So we put the six in here. Now this problem is in billions. Okay, and e to the rt. Notice this is the continuous compounding formula. P equals rt. Okay, um, where t is the time. T is the time since the year 2000. Okay, according to this mom, model, what will the world's population be in the year 2010? Well, in the years 2010, that has to be year 10. And we don't know what that population is going to be. So we're going to go ahead and stick that in here. P is unknown. The initial amount is in billion six. The seems to be growing at a rate of about 2% per year. And 10 years would be 10. So we'll just grab the calculator and punch that in. And I went ahead and punched that in. It's a little small to read there, but it looks to be about 7.3 billion, um, 7.33 billion in the year 2010. 7.33, and that is billion. Let's look at the problem that goes along with it, number 59. All right, 59 is going to end up using the same formula here, but let's go ahead and read it. Some experts have estimated the world's food supply can support a population of at most 18 billion. According to this model, for how many more years will the world's population remain at 18 billion or less? So the population is what we know now and we want to find the time. So if we put 18 billion in here and solve for t, You'll notice we'll have to use logarithms to solve for t in this problem. By the way, what we're seeing is that the population would have tripled since the year 2000. Went from six, excuse me, six billion to 18 billion since the year 2000. So let's go ahead and solve this for t. We're going to start by dividing by the initial amount here, and we get three, which stands kind of for tripling. And then we're going to have to use logarithms to get this t down from its perch. Since it's a base of E, we're going to use the natural log base E. Although we could use any log we wanted to, any, but this makes it easier if we do. Natural log base E of 3 equals the natural log base E of E to the point O 2 T. So again, once again, natural log base E and, and base of E are going to undo each other. And another way to say that is this drives around to the front and becomes a multiplier. Okay, because the request was to power, we're going to multiply, so point O2 T, and log base E of E goes out because this is times 1, that's actually 1. So now all we have to do is divide by O2, point O2, and we end up with T alone. Let's go ahead and calculate that amount. All right, I've gone ahead and punched that number in the calculator here. Um, once again, I'm using the natural log base E, but of course the calculator doesn't show the E there, the natural log base E of 3. I used an extra set of parentheses here that I didn't need, but I'm in the habit of kind of doing that for numerators and denominators. I could have put them over here too, but I didn't, didn't really need them. So let's go ahead and find out what that's equal to. 54.9. 54.9. Well, what is T? Well, T is time in years. So what it's telling us is that in about 55 years the world's population will reach 18 billion. 55 years. Well what year would that be? Since the year 2000? Since the year 2000 if we were to add 55 to that that gives us the year 2055. So it tells us that, that year we, the population, world's population will reach about 18 billion. These things are a little hard to predict, especially since food production continues to grow pretty rapidly. The, the food production processes are always increasing. The amount of food produced now is enormous compared to what it used to be. So that doesn't necessarily mean much there, but, but we know that the world's population will reach 18 billion in the year about 2055, barring any other situations. Okay, let's take a look at your homework.
All right, so you're ready for assignment L now. Uh, I put some of these problems we did already today. Also notice there's a, been a slight change to what was on your sheet. This is actually the even problems. You've already done the odd ones, so you don't need to do those, but 38 to 52 even. But uh, do the best you can. They usually give you formulas to work with, but remember our new formula that A equals uh, P times E to the RT is about continuous uh, compounding. You, you'll need that as well. All right, it's exciting. The next, next uh, video is going to be about applications, all completely about applications, and we're nearing the end of the chapter here as we do that. So enjoy that. We'll see you next time.